Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me. I hope that you can hear me. Let me know. I have to actually find myself in YouTube world um, to see if I'm live or not. Did everyone have a good weekend? We're here on Sunday. Did everyone enjoy their weekend? Hi, Mezra. Hi, Steph. Thank you guys for being here. Hi to everybody listening. So today we're going to be finishing Lullaby. And last time I was reminded by somebody in the comments to add it to the playlist, part three. Thank you for doing that. Um, so I will add this when we're done to the playlist. Basically, you'll just be able to play the playlist from part one to four it'll be like eight hours i think today will be like two hours and 15 minutes um and you can just have the whole book play in eight hours that's a good time sleeping i feel right like an eight hour um so at any i don't know if um stuff you have my email terrible ketone email and if anyone ever feels like they want some like these pictures that I show that I've taken if you want them as prints just email me and um I'll get it out to you this is um time we had in the Salton Sea they had an art show going on and this girl was brave enough to go into the murky water and pose for us um anonymous but she did a wonderful job and it came out as a really good photo hi club de medicado vip thank you i know it's late for you so thanks for being here we're gonna start so we're on chapter 32 and it goes to chapter 44 and that's you know pretty much where we are hi Mueller. Thank you for being here. Okay, you guys ready? Do you have your favorite drink? Are you all cozy and ready to get this done? Find out what happens to all of the characters in the book. Okay. Chapter 32. The town's name is Stone River on the map. Stone River, Nebraska. But when the Sarge and I get there, the sign at the city limits is painted over with the name Shiva Purum, Nebraska, population 17,000. In the middle of the street, straddling the center line, dashes the brown and white cow. We have to swerve around. Chewing its cud, the cow doesn't flinch. The downtown is two blocks of red brick buildings. A yellow signal light blinks above the main intersection. A black cow is scratching its side against the middle pole with a, of a stop sign. A white cow eats zinnias out of a window box in front of the post office. Another cow lies blocking the sidewalk at the station. You smell curry and patchouli. The deputy sheriffs wearing skulls, the deputy, the mailman, the waitress in the cafe, the bartender in the tavern, they're all wearing a black dot between their eyes, a bindi. Crimery, the sarge says. one has gone Hindu. According to this week's Psychic Wonders Bulletin, this is all because of the talk. Judas and operation. The trick is to fool cows into climbing the chute that leads to the killing floor. They're confused, scared. After hours or days squeezed, hydrated, the cows are thrown in with other cows in the feedlot outside the slaughterhouse. How you them to climb the is you send in the Judas cow. This is really what the cow is called. 
It's a cow that lives at the slaughterhouse. It mingles with the doomed cows and leads them up into the chute to the killing floor. The scared, spooked cows would never go except for the Judas cow leading the way. The last step before the axe or the knife or the steel bolt through the skull. At that last, the Judas cow died. It survives to lead another herd to their death. It does this for its entire life. Until, according to the Psychic Wonders Bulletin, the Judas cow at the Stone River meat packing plant, one day it stopped. The Judas cow stood blocking the doorway to the killing floor. It refused to step aside and let the herd behind it die. With the whole slaughterhouse crew watching, the Judas cow sat on its hind legs the way a dog sits. The cow sat there in the doorway and looked at everyone with its brown cow and talked. The Judas cow talked. It said, Reject eating ways. The cow's voice was the voice of a young woman. The cows in line behind it, they shifted their way from foot to foot, waiting. The slaughterhouse crew. Their mouths fell open so fast, their cigarettes dropped out on the bloody floor. Swallowed his chewing tobacco. A woman screamed through her fingers. The sitting there, it raised one front leg to point its hoof at the crew and said, The path to moksha is not through pain and suffering of other creatures. Moksha, said the Psychic Wonders Bulletin, is a Sanskrit word for redemption, the end of the karmic cycle of reincarnation. The Judas cow talked all afternoon. It said human beings had destroyed the world. It said man must stop exterminating other species. Man must limit its numbers, create a quota system which allows only a small percentage of the planet's beings to be human. Humans could live any way they liked so long as they were not the majority. It taught them a Hindu song. The cow made the whole crew sing along while it swung back and forth to the beat of the song. The cow answered all their questions about the nature of life and death. The Judas cow just droned on and on and on. Now, here and now, and I, we're here after the fact, witch hunting. We're looking at all those released from the meat packing plant that day. The plant is empty and quiet on the far edge of town. Someone's painting the concrete building pink, making an ashram. They've planted vegetables in the feedlot. The Judas cow hasn't said a word since. It eats gravel's front yards. It drinks from bird baths. People hang daisy chains around its neck. They're using the occupation spell, the Sarge says. We're stopped in the street waiting for a huge, slow hawk to cross in front of our car. Other pigs and chickens stayed in the shade under the hardware store awning. An occupation spell lets you protect. An occupation spell lets you project your consciousness the physical body of another being. I look at him too long and ask if he isn't the pot calling the kettle black. Animals, pee, the starch says, you can put yourself into pretty much any living body. And I say, tell me about it. We drive past the, ma the man painting the pink ashram and the starch says, if you ask me, Reincarnation is just another way to procrastinate. And I say, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's already got one. The Sarge reaches across the front seat to put his wrinkled, spotted hand over mine. 
The back of his hand is carpeted with gray hairs. His finger from handling his pistol. The Sarge squeezes my hand and says, do you still love me? And I have a choice. Chapter 33. The crowds of people shoulder around us. The women in halter tops and men in cowboy hats. People are eating caramel apples on sticks and shaved ice and paper cones. Dust is everywhere. Somebody steps on Helen's foot and she pulls it back saying, I find that no matter how many people I kill, it's never enough. I say, let's not talk shop. The ground is crisscrossed with thick black cables. The darkness beyond the lights, engines burn diesel to make electricity. You can smell diesel and deep fried food, vomit and powdered sugar. These days, this is what passes for fun. A scream sails past us and a glimpse of Mona. It's a carnival ride with bright neon signs that say the octopus. Black metal arms like twisted spokes churn around a hub. At the same time, they dip up and at the end of each arm is a seat and each seat spins in its own hub. The screams sail by and a banner of red and black hair. Her pains and charms are flung straight out from the other side of Mona's neck. Both her hands are clamped guard are fastened across her lap. The ruins of Western civilization, the turrets and towers and chimney high of Mona's hair, and I coin bullets past us. Helen watches her saying, I guess Mona got her flying spot pager goes off again. It's the same number as the police detective. A new savior is already hot on my tail. The more people die, the more things stay the same. I turn the pager off and watching Mona scream by bad news, I say nothing important. In her pink high heels, Helen picks the mud, sawdust, stepping the black cable car, the black power cables. Holding out my hand, I say, here, and she takes it. And I don't go, and she doesn't seem to mind. And we're walking hand in hand. Nice. Got only a few big rings left, so it doesn't hurt as much as you think. The carnival rides thrash the air around us. Diamond white, emerald green, ruby red lights, turquoise and sapphire blue lights, the yellow of cigarettes, the orange of honey amber. Rock music blares out of the speakers mounted on poles everywhere. These rockaholics these quiet aphobics. I ask Helen, when was the last time she rode a Ferris wheel? Everywhere there are men and women hand in hand, kissing. They're feeding each other shards of pig cotton candy. They walk side by side, each with one hand stuck in the butt pocket of the other's tight jeans. Watching the crowd, Helen says, don't take the wrong way. But when last time? My last time for what? You know. I'm not sure if my last time counts, but it might be about 18 years ago. And Helen smiles and says, I wonder you walk funny, she said. I have 20 years and counting since John. On the ground with the sawdust and cables. There's a crumpled paper page. A three column advertisement says, attention, Patriot and Boyle Real Estate Agency. The ad says, have you been sold a haunted house? If so, please call the following verdict of a class action lawsuit. Oyster cell phone number. 
then I say, please, Helen, why did you tell him that stuff? Helen looks at the newspaper ad. With her pink shoe, she grinds it into the mud, saying, for the same reason I didn't care. He could be variable at times. Next to the ad, covered in mud, is the photo of another dead fashion model. Looking up at the wheel of red and white fluorescent tubes holding seats that sway, full of people, Helen says. That looks doable. A man stops and all the carts swing in place while Helen and I sit on a red plastic cushion and then the guard bar sh shut across our lap. He steps back and pulls a lever and the big diesel engine catches. The Ferris wheel jerks as if it's rollerward and Helen and I rise into the darkness. Give me a second. Sisters, is it sounding bad? Because I'm hearing, this is like the weirdest thing, but I'm hearing, I hear Odin breathing in my ear, my, but I hear um, like other, <laughs> it's weird. I, I hear like other people and <laughs> there's no one, like it's just me. So um, give me a minute. Let me turn off the fan and it'll probably be doable. It's not that hot today. Give me a minute. Let's see if this fixes it. Yeah, there's like something going on. I don't know what it is. Hopefully this fixes it. I think also when I get like kind of close to the mic, so I have to be a little bit further away, I feel. Hopefully you guys can hear. Okay. Hopefully it's better now. Let's see what happens. Um, okay. So halfway up into the night, the water stop our swings and help the fast grab for the guard bar. A diamond solitaire slips off one and just straight through the struts, the colors and faces down into the gears of the machine. Helen looks at it saying, well, that was roughly $35,000. I say, maybe it's okay. It's a. And Helen says, that's the problem. Gemstones are the hardest things on earth, but they still break. They can make constant stress and pressure, but a sudden sharp impact can shatter them into dust. Across the midway floor, Mona comes running over and st to stand below us. Waving both hands, she jumps in place and yells, Woo! Go, Helen! Wheel jerks, starting again. The seat tilts, and Helen's purse starts to fall. She grabs it. The gray rock still inside it, the gift from Oyster's Coven. Instead of her purse, then her book slides off the seat, being open in the air tumbling down to land in the sawdust and Mona runs over and up. Mona slaps the book on her thigh to knock off the sawdust then shakes it in the air to show it's okay. Helen says, thank God, Mona. And I say, Mona said you planned to kill me. And Helen says, she told me that you wanted to kill me. Look at each other. I say, thank God for Mona. And Helen says, buy me some Karen. On the ground, farther and farther away, Mona's looking through the pages of the planner. Every day, the name Helen's political target. Looking up, out of lights and into the night sky, we're getting closer to the stars. Mona once said that stars are the best part of being alive. 
on the other side where people go after they die, they can't see the stars. Think of our deep outer space, incredible quiet and cold. The, he the heaven where silence is reward enough. I need to go home and clean something up. It has to be pretty soon before things get worse. The dead fashion models, Nash, the police detectives, all of it. How he got the culling spell, I don't know. We rise higher farther away from the smells, away from the diesel engine noise. We rise up into the quiet and cold. Mona reading the planner book, all the crowds of people, their money and elbows and cowboy boots get small. The food booth and toilets get smaller. The screams and rock music, smaller. At the top, truck to a stop. Our seat sways less and less until we're sitting still. High up, the breeze teases, rats, combs Helen's pink bubble of hair, the neon and grease and mud. From this far away, it all looks perfect, perfect, safe, and happy. The music's just dull, thud, thud. God. This is how we must look to God, looking down at the rides, in colors and screams, Helen says. I'm glad you found me out. I think I always hoped someone would, she says. I'm glad it was you. Her life isn't so bad. Jules, she has Patrick. Still, she says, it's nice to have one person who knows all your secrets. It is like it's not a regular robin's egg blue. It's the blue of a robin's egg you might find and worry that it won't hatch because it's dead inside. And then it does hatch and you worry about what to do next. On the guard bar locked across and puts her hand on mine and says, Mr. Strediter, do you have a first name? Carl. I say, Carl, it's Carl Strediter. I ask, why did she call me middle eight? And Helen laughs and says, you are, we both are. The wheel jerks again and we're coming back down. And I say, her eyes, I say, they're blue. And this is my life. At the bottom, the carnival man in the garden. And I in my hand as she steps out of the seat. The sawdust is loose and soft and we limp and stumble through the crowds, holding each other around the waist. We get to Mona and she's still reading the planner book. Time for some caramel corn, Helen says. Carl, here, it's going to buy. And the book's still open in her hands. Mona looks up, her mouth open a little, her eyes once, twice three times fast. She sighs and says, you know the grimoire we're looking for? She says, I think we just found Chapter 34. Some witches write their spell runes, secret coded symbols. According to Mona, some witches write backwards so the spell can only be in a mirror. They write spells in spirals in the center of the page and curving outward. Some write like the ancient Greek curse tablets with one line running from left to right, then the next running to left and left to right. This they call the boost off, boost trough form because it's the back and forth piece of an ox tied to a tether. To mimic a snake, Mona says, some write each line branches in a different direction. Only rule was a spell has to be twisted. The more hidden, the more twisted, the more power spell to witches, the twists themselves are magical. They draw or the magician god Hepatus 
with his legs twisted. The more twisted the devil, the more it will twist and hobble the victim. It'll kill them, occupy their attention. They'll stumble, get dizzy, not concentrate. The same big brother with all his singing and dancing. In the gravel parking lot, halfway between the carnival and Helen's car, Mona holds the planner book so the lights of the carnival shine through just one page. At first, the Helen's written for that day named Captain Antonio Capelli and a list of real estate appointments. Then you can see a faint pattern in the paper. Words, yellow sentences, blue paragraphs, as each light passes behind the page. Invisible ink, Mona says, still holding the page out. It's faint as a watermark. Ghost writing. What ticked me off the binding, Mona says. The cover and binding are red leather, polished almost black with handling. It's human skin, Mona says. It was in Basil Frankie's house, Helen says. It looked like a book, empty book. She bought it with Frankie's estate. On the cover, it's a five-point star. A pentagram, Mona says. And before it was a book, this was somebody's tech. This little bump, she says, Spot on book's spine. This is a nipple. Mona closes the book and holds it out to Helen. Feel, she says. This is beyond gent. And Helen snaps her purse open and gets out her pair of little with the button and the cuff. She says, no, you hold it. Looking at the book open in her hands, Mona leaves back and forth. She says, if I just knew what they used as ink, I'd know how to read it. If it's ammonia or vinegar, she said, you'd add cabbage and dab some on the broth to turn the ink purple. If it's semen, you could read it under light. I say, people spells in Peter tracks? And Mona says, only the most powerful type of spells. It's written in a clear solution corner. She could dab on iodine to make the letters stand out. If it was lemon juice, she says, you'd heat the peaches to make the ink turn brown. Try tasting it, Helen says, to see if it's sour. And Mona slams the book shut. It's a thousand-year-old book bound in mummified skin and probably written in ancient cum, she says to Helen. You lick it. And Helen says, okay, I can Try at least not to hurry. Try at least to hurry and translate it. She says, I'm not the one who's been carrying it around for 10 years. I'm not the one who's been ruining it, writing over the top of everything. Holds the book in both hands, shoves it at Helen. This is an ancient book. It's written in archaic forms of Greek and Latin, plus some forgotten kinds of runes, she says. I'm going to need some time here, Helen says, and snaps open her purse. She takes out a folding square of paper and a donut thing. Here's a copy of Culling Song. A man named Basil Frankie translated this much. If you can match it to one of the spells in that book, you can use that as a key to translate all the spells in that language, she says, like in the Rosetta Stone. And Mona reaches to the folded paper. And I snatch it from Helen's hand and ask, why are we even having this discussion? I said, my idea was we'd burn book. I open the paper and it's page 27 stolen from some library. And I say, we need to think of this. To Helen, I say, are you sure you want to do this to Mona? This spell has pretty much ruined our I say, what Mona knows is going to know. Helen is flexing her fingers into the white gloves. She buttons each cuff and reaches up Mona saying, give me the book. 
I can do it, Mona says. Helen shaded at Mona and says, no, this is best. Strategor's right. It will change things for you. The night air is full of faint, faraway screams and glowing colors. And Mona says, no, and wraps both arms around the book, holding it to her chest. You see, Helen says, it's already started when there's the possibility of a little power you already want more. I tell to give the book to Helen. And Mona turns her back to us saying, I'm the one who found it. I'm the only one who can read it. She turns to look over and shoulder at me and says, you just want to destroy it so you can sell the story. You want everything resolved so it's safe to talk about. And Helen says, Mona, honey, don't. And Mona turns to look over her other shoulder at Helen and says, you just want it so you can rule the world. You're just into the money side of everything. Her shoulders roll forward until she seems to wrap her whole body around the book and she looks down on it saying, I'm the only one who appreciates it for what it is. And I tell her, listen to Helen. It's a book of shadows, Mona says, a real book of shadows. It belongs with the real witch. Just let me translate it. I'll tell you what I find, I promise. Me, I'm, I fold the culling spell from Helen and tuck it in my back. I tuck it in my back pocket. I take a step closer to Mona. I look at Helen and she nods. Still with her breast, Mona says, I'll bring Patrick back, she says. I'll bring back all the little children. And I grab her around the waist behind and lift. Mona screaming, her heels into my shins and twisting from side to side. Still holding the book, I work my hands up under her arms and t- touching dead human skin. The dead nipple, Mona's nipples. Mona screaming and her fingernails dig to my hands. The soft skin between my fingers. She digs into the skin on the back of my hands until I get her around the wrist and twist her arm up and away from her sides. The book falls and with her kicking legs, knocking it away and in the dark parking lot with distant screams, nobody knows Hold on a second. What happened, Steph? It's t- it's pinging. Is it like really bad? Is it still going on right now? I'm just not sure I can do about it because I don't know what it's from. Um, so even after I turned off the fan, it's still doing this. Hi, Darcy. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I just don't know how to fix it at this point. It's really annoying. Hopefully it's not that bad. Um, it's a robotic sound. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what I, I don't know like how to help it. I don't know what's wrong. Um, we did have a plane flyover, which was unfortunate, but I'm trying to keep like as far from the mic as possible. I don't know if it's still not helping. Yeah, sorry about that one. That probably woke up. Um, yeah, I don't know. Hopefully it'll disappear. So let's see what happens. I don't even know where I left off. Okay. Um, this is the life I got. This is the daughter I knew someday over a boyfriend, over bad grades, drugs. Somehow this break always happens. The power struggle. No matter how great a father you think you'd make, at some time you'll find yourself here. There are worse things you can do to the people you love than kill them. 
the book lands in a spray of dust and gravel and I yell for Helen to get it. The moment Mona is free, Helen and I step back. Helen holding her book, I'm looking to see if anybody's around. Her hands and fists, Mona leans toward us, her red and black hair hanging in her face. Her silver chains and charms are tangled in her hair. Her orange chest is twisted tight around her body, the neckline torn on one side so her shoulders show bare. She's kicked off her sandals so she's barefoot. Her eyes behind the dark snarls of her hair, her eyes reflecting the carnival lights. The screams in the distance could be the echo of her on and on forever. How she looks is wicked, a wicked witch, a sorceress. She's no my dog. Now she's someone I may never understand, a stranger. And through her teeth, says, I could kill you. I could. And I finger comb her. I straighten my tie and tuck the front of my smooth. I'm counting one, counting two, counting three. And I tell her, no, but we could kill her. I tell her she owes Mrs. Boyle an apology. This is what passes as tough love. Helen stands, holding the book in her white gloved hands, looking at Mona. Mona says nothing. The smoke from the diesel generators, the screams, the rock music, the colored lights, their best to fill in the silence. The stars in the night sky don't say a word. Helen turns to me and says, I'm okay, let's just get going. She gets out her car keys and gives them to me. Helen and I, we turn away and start walking. Both looking back, I see Mona laughing. She's laughing. Mona stops laughing when I see her, but her smile is still there. And I tell her to the smirk off her face. I ask, what the hell does she have to smirk about? Chapter 35. With me driving, Mona sits in the back seat with her arms folded. Helen sits in the front seat next to me, the grimoire open in her lap, each page against her window so she can see the sunlight through it. On the front seat between us, her cell phones. At home, Helen says she still has a reference book from Basil Frankie's estate. These include translation dictionaries of Greek, Latin, Sanskrit. There are ancient cuneiform writing, all the dead languages. Something in one of those books will let her translate the grimoire. Using the culling spell as a sort of code key, a Rosetta Stone, be able to translate them all. And Helen's cell phone rings. In the rear view mirror, Mona picks her nose and rolls the booger against the leg of her jeans until it's hard, dark, lump. She looks up from her lap, her eyes rolling up slow until she's looking at the back of Helen's head. Helen's cell phone rings. And Mona flips her booger into the back of Helen's pink hair. And Helen's cell phone rings. Her eyes still in the grimoire. Helen pushes the phone across the seat until it presses my thighs saying, tell them I'm busy. It could be the state department with her next hit as, with her next hit assignment. It could be some other government, some cloak and dagger business to conduct, a drug kingpin to rub out, or a career criminal to retire. Mona opens her green brocade book, her witch's diary, in her lap and starts scribbling in it with colored pens. On the phone, it's a client holding the phone against my chest. I say, the woman says a severed head bounced down the front stairway last night. Still reading the grimoire, Helen says, that would be the five bedroom Dutch colonial on Finley Drive, she says. Did it disappear before it landed in the foot? 
I ask. To Helen, I say, yes, disappeared about halfway down her way, a hideous bloody head with a leering smile. The woman on the phone says something. And broken teeth, I say, they're upset. A little hard, the color pen squeak against the paper and still reading the grimoire. It appeared and a problem. The woman on the phone says, it happens every night. So call an exterminator, Helen says. She holds another page against the sunlight and says, tell her I'm not here. The picture that Mona's drawn in her mirror book, it's a man and a woman being struck by lightning, then being run over by a tank, then bleeding to death through their eyes, their brain out over their ears. The woman wears a tail suit and a lot of jewelry, the man a blue tie. I'm counting one, counting two, counting three. Mona takes the man and woman and tears them into thin strips. And I answer it. I hold the phone against my chest and I tell Helen, it's some guy. He says his shower sprays blood. Still holding the grimoire against the window, Helen says, Next bedroom on Pender Court. And Mona says, Pender Place? Pender Court has a severed hand that crawls out of the garbage disposal. She opens the car window a little and starts feeding the shredded man and woman out through the crack. You're thinking of the severed hand at Palm Corners, Helen says. Pender Place has the biting phantom Doberman. The man on the phone, I ask him to please hold. I press the red hold button. Mona rolls her eyes and says, the biting ghost is in the Spanish house just off Millstone Boulevard. She starts writing something with a red felt tip pen, writing so the words spiral out from the center of the page. Counting nine, counting 10, counting 11. Squinting at the lines of faint writing on the page spread against the window, Helen says, tell them I'm out of the real estate business. Trailing her finger along each faint word says, the people at Pender are teenagers, right? I ask and the man on the phone says, yes. And Helen turns to look at Mona in the back seat. Mona flicking another roll and Helen says, then tell him a bathtub full of human blood is the least problems. I say, how about we just keep driving? We could hit a few more libraries, see lights, another carnival monument. We could have some laughs, loosen up a little. We were a family once. We could be one again. We of each other, hypothetically speaking, I say, how about it? Mona leans forward and yanks a few strands of hair out of my head, leans and yanks a few pink strands from Helen, and Helen ducks forward over the grimoire saying, Mona, that hurt. In my family, I say, my parents and I, we could settle over a rousing game of Parcheesi. The strands of hair, pink and brown, Mona the page of spy writing and I tell Mona I just don't want her to make the same mistakes I made her in the rear mirror I say when I married, I stopped talking to my parents I haven't talked to them in almost 20 years and Mona sticks a baby pin through the page folded with our hair inside Helen's phone rings again and this time it's a man a young man it's oyster and before I can hang up, he says, hey, you'll want to make sure and read tomorrow's newspaper. He says, I put a little surprise in it for you. He says, now let me talk to Mulberry. I say her name's Mona, Mona Sabat. It's Mona, it's Mona Stenier, Helen says, holding a page of the grill to the window, trying to read the secret writing. And Mona says, is that oyster? From reaches around both of my head, sides of my head, grabbing for the phone and saying, let me talk. She she shouts, oyster, oyster, they have the 
and me trying to steer the car, the car veering all over the highway, I flip the phone shut. Chapter six. Instead of the stain on my apartment ceiling, there's a big white. Push pin to the front door, there's a note from the landlord. Instead of noise, there's total quiet. The carpet is crunchy with little bits of plastic, broken down doors and flying buttresses. You can hear the filament buzzing in each light bulb. You can hear my watch tick. In the refrigerator, the milk's gone sour. All that pain and suffering wasted. The cheese is huge and blue with mold. A bunch of hamburger has gone gray inside its plastic wrap. The eggs look okay, but they're not. They can't be, not after this long. All that is, and it's all going in the garbage. The contributions of all those miserable cows and landlord says the white patch on the ceiling is a is a primer. It says stain stops being through. They'll paint the whole ceiling. The heat's on high to dry the primer faster. Water and the the plants are dry as paper. The trap under the kitchen sinks half empty and sewer gas is up. Everything I call home smells of shit. So is to keep my neighbor from bleeding through. Out in the world, there's still 39 copies of the poems book unaccounted for in libraries and bookstore homes, give or take, I don't know, a few dozen. Helen's in her office today. That's what left her, sitting at her desk with dictionaries open around her. Greek, Latin, and Sanskrit dictionaries, translation dictionaries. She's got a little bottle of iodine, and she's using a cotton swab to dab it on the writing, turning the invisible words red. Using cotton swab, Helen's dabbing the juice from cabbage on her invisible words, turning them purple. Next to these little bottles and cotton swabs, the dictionaries sit a light with the handle. A cord trails from it to an outlet in the wall. A fluoroscope, Helen says. It's rented. She flicks the switch on and holds the open grimoire, turning the pages until one page is filled with glowing pink words. This one's written in semen. On all the spells, the handwriting's different. Mona at her desk in the outer office hasn't said any since the carnival. The police scanner is saying one emergency code after another. Helen calls to Mona. What's a good word for demon? And Mona says, have it Helen Hoover Boyle. Helen looks at me and says, have you seen today's paper? She shoves some books to one side and under them is a newspaper. She flips through it and there on the back page of the first section is a full page ad. The first line says, Tension. Have you seen this man? Most of the page is an old picture, my wedding picture, me and Gina, smiling 20 years ago. This has to be from our wedding announcement in some ancient Saturday edition. Public declaration of commitment and love for each other, our pledge, our vows, the old power of words till death do us part. Below that, the ad copy says, police are only looking for this man for questioning in connection with several recent deaths. He is 40 years old, five feet, 10 inches tall, weighs 180 pounds and has brown hair and green eyes. He's unarmed, but should be considered highly dangerous. The man in the photo is so young and innocent. He's not me. The woman is dead. Both those people, ghosts. The photo, it says, he now goes by the alias Carl Stredener. He often wears a tie. 
Below that it says, if you know his whereabouts, please call 911 and ask for the police. If Oyster ran this ad or the police did, I don't know. Helen and me standing here looking down at the picture, Helen says, your wife was really pretty. And I say, she was. Helen's fingers, her yellow suit, her carved and varnished antique desk, they're all stained and smudged red and purple with iodine and cabbage juice, the stained smell of ammonia and vinegar. She holds the floor over the book and reads the ancient Peter tracks. I've got a flying spell here, she says, and one of these might be a love spell. She flips back and forth each page smelling like cabbage farts or ammonia piss. The culling spell, she says, it's this one. Ancient Z In the outer office, Mona's talking on the phone. Helen puts her hand on my arm and pushes me back a step. A step away from the desk, she says. Watch this, and stands there, both hands pressed to her temples, her eyes closed. What's supposed to happen? Mona hangs up her telephone in the outer office. The grimoire open on Helen's desk. It shifts. One corner lifts, the opposite corner. It starts to close by itself, then opens, closes and opens faster and faster until it rises off the desk. Her eyes still closed. Helen's lips move around silent words, rocking and flapping. The book's a shining dark starling hovering near the ceiling. And the police scanner crackles and says, Unit 17, it says, please proceed to 5680 Whedon Avenue, Northeast, the Helen Boyle Real Estate Office, and apprehend an adult male for questioning. The grimoire hits the desk with a crash. Iodine, ammonia, vinegar, and cabbage juice splashing everywhere. Papers books sliding to the floor. Helen yells, Mona! And I say, don't kill her. Please don't kill her. And Helen grabs my hand in her stained hand and says, I think you'd better get out of here. She says, do you remember when we first met? Whispering, she says, meet me there tonight. In my apartment, all the tape in my answering machine is used up. In my mailbox, the bill is so I have to dig them out with a button. On the kitchen table is a shopping mall half built. Even without the picture on the box, you can tell what it is because the parking lots are laid out. The walls are in place. The windows and doors sit off to one side. The glass installed already. The window panels and big heating cooling units are still in the box. The landscaping is sealed in a plastic bag. Coming through the wall, there's nothing. No one. After weeks on the road with Helen and Mona, I've forgotten how silence was so golden. I turn on the television. Some black and white comedy about a man come back from the dead as a mule. He's supposed to teach somebody something to save his own soul. A man's spirit occupying a mule's body. My pager goes off again. The police, my saviors, needling me towards salvation. My pager off. The police or the manager. This place has got to be under some kind of surveillance. On the floor, scattered all over the floors, there's the stomping fragments of lumber mills. There's the busted ruins of train station flecked with dried blood. Around that, a medical dental office building lies in a billion pieces and an airplane hangar crushed. A ferry boat terminal leaked up. All the bloody ruins and artifacts of what I worked so hard to put together, all of them scattered and cracked under my shoes. What's left of my normal life? Turn on the clock radio next to the bed. Sitting cross-legged on the floor, I reach out and scrape together the remains of gas stations and mortuaries and stands and Spanish monasteries. I pile up the co bits covered with blood and dust, and the radio plays big band swing music. The radio plays Celtic folk music, ghetto rap, and Indian sitar music. Piled in front of me are the parts for sanitariums and movie studios, 
grain elevators and oil refineries. On the radio is electronic trance music, reggae and waltz music. Here there are parts of cathedrals and prisons and army barracks. With a little brush and glue, I put together smokestacks and skylights, homes and minyet. Romanesque aqueducts run into art deco penthouses, run into opium dens, run into World West saloons, run into roller coasters, run into small town Carnegie libraries, run into track houses, run into college lecture halls. After weeks on the road with Helen and Mona, I've forgotten how perfection was so important. On my computer, there's a draft of the crib death story, the last chapter. It's the type of story that every parent and grandparent is too afraid to read and too afraid not to read. There's really no new information. The idea was to show how people cope, people forward with their lives. We could show the deep inner well of strength and compassion each of these people discovers. That all we know about infant sudden death is there is no pattern. A baby can die in its mother's arms. This is still unfinished. The best way to waste your life is by taking notes. The easiest way to avoid living is just to watch. Look for the deep report. Don't participate. Let Big Brother do the singing and dancing for you. Report. Be a good witness, a grateful member of the audience. On the radio, waltz music runs into punk, runs into punk, runs into rap, runs into Gorgonian chants, runs into chamber music. On television, so showing sink. I glue together bay windows and glowing vaults, vaults and jack arches and stairways and windows and mosaic floors and steel curtain walls and half-tempered glade bowl and iconic pilasters. On the radio is African drum music and French torch songs all mixed together. On the floor in front of me are Chinese pegdoas and Mexican hacendas and Cape Cod colonial houses, all combined. On television, a woman wins $10,000 for knowing the first line of the Gettysburg Address. My first house I ever put together was a storage room, mansard roof, and two staircases, a front one for family and a rear servant staircase. It had metal and glass chandeliers you wired with tiny light bulbs. It had a parquet floor in the dining room that took six weeks of cutting and gluing to piece together. It had a ceiling in the music room that my wife Gina stayed up late night after night with clouds and angels. It had a fireplace in the dining room with a fire I made out of cut glass with a flickering light behind it. We set the table with tiny plates and Gina stayed up at night painting roses around the border of each plate. The two of us, those nights with no television or radio. And asleep, it seemed so important at the time. Those were the two people in that photo. That was for Karen's birthday. Everything had to be perfect. To be something that would prove our time and intelligence, masterpiece to outlive us. Oranges and gasoline, the glue smell, mixes with the smell of shit. On my finger, the glue smell there, my hands are crusted with picture windows and porches and air conditioners. Stuck to my shirt are turnstiles and escalators and trees, and I turn the radio up. All that work and love and effort Time, my life, waste, everything I hope would outlive me, I've ruined. That afternoon, I found them. I left in the fridge. I left the clothes in the closets. The afternoon I came home and knew what I'd done. 
That the first house I jumped in here without an air. The tiny chandeliers and glass fire and dinner plates stuck in my shoes. I left a trail of tiny doors and shelves and chairs and windows and blood all the way to the airport. Beyond the trail ended and sitting here, I've run out of parts. All the walls and roofs and handrails and what's glued to the floor in front of me is a bloody mess. It's nothing perfect or complete, but this is what I've made of my life. Right or wrong, it follows no great plan. All you can do is hope for a pattern to emerge, and sometimes it never does. Still, with a plan, you only get the best you can imagine. I'd always hope for something better than that. A blast of French horns comes on the, the clatter of teletype, and a man's voice says how police have found yet another fashion model. The television shows a smiling picture. They've arrested another suspect boyfriend. Another autopsy shows signs of postmortem sexual intercourse. My pager again. The number on my page is my new savior. My hands lumpy with, sh with shutters and doors. I pick up the phone. My fingers rough with plumbing and gutters. I dial a number I can't forget. A man answers. And I say, Dad? I say, Dad, it's me. I tell him where I'm living. I tell him the name I use now. I tell him where I work. I tell him what that I know how it looks with Gina and Katrin dead, but I didn't do it. I just ran. He, he saw the wedding picture in today's newspaper. He knows who I am now. A couple of weeks ago, I drove by our house. I say, I saw him and mom walking in the front yard. I was parked down the street under a flowing cherry, under a flowering cherry tree. My car Helen's car, covered in pink petals. Both he and mom, I say, they both would. I tell him I've missed him, too. I love him, too. I tell him I'm okay. I say, I don't know what to do, I say, but it's all going to be okay. After that, I just listen. I wait for him to stop crying so I can say, sorry. Chapter 37. The Bartoller Estate in Moonlight, an eight bedroom Georginian style house with seven bathrooms, four fireplaces, all of it in white, all of it's echoing with each step across the pol polished floors. The house is dark without lights, it's cold without furniture or rugs. Here, Helen says, we can do it here where no one will see us. She flicks a light switch inside a doorway. The ceiling goes up so high it could be the sky. Light from a looming chandelier, the size of a crystal weather balloon. The light turns the tall windows into mirrors. The light throws our shadows out behind us on the wood floor. This is the 1500 foot ballroom. Me, I'm out of job. The police are after me. My apartment stinks. My first full page in the paper. I spent a day hiding in the shrubs around the front door, waiting for dark, for Helen Hoover Boyle to tell me what she had in mind. This is the grimoire under one arm. The page is stained purple. She opens it in her hands and shows the English words written in black pen below the foreign gibberish of the original. Say it, she says. Well, read it out loud. And I ask, what's this do? And Helen says, just watch out for the chandelier. She starts reading. It's dull and even, as if she were counting, as if they were numbers reading and her purse starts to float up from where it hangs near her waist. Her purse floats higher until it's tethered to her by her shoulder strap. 
above her head as a yellow balloon. Helen keeps reading and my tie floats out in front of me, rising like a blue out of basket. It brushes my nose. Helen's skirt, the hem starts to rise and she grabs it and holds it down between her legs with one hand. She's reading as shoelaces dance in the air. Her dangle earrings, pearls and emeralds float up alongside her ears. Her pearl necklace, it floats up around her face. It floats over her head, a hovering pearl glow. Helen looks up at me and keeps My sport coat floats up under my arms. Helen's getting taller. She's eye level with me. Up at her feet, hang, toes pointed down. They're hanging above the floor. One yellow shoe, then the other drops off and clatters on the wood. Her voice flat and even. Helen looks down at me and smiles. And then one of my feet isn't touching the ground. My other foot goes limp and I kick the way you do in deep water, trying to find the bottom of a swimming pool. I throw my hands out for purchase. Kick. Feet pitch up behind me until I'm looking face down at the ballroom floor. Four, six, eight feet below me. Me and my shadow getting farther and farther apart. My shadow getting smaller and smaller. Helen says, Carl, watch out. Something cold, brittle wraps around me. Sharp bits of something loose drape around my neck and snag in my hair. It's the chandelier, Carl says. Careful. My ass buried in the middle of the crystal beads and shards. I'm wrapped in a sh tinkling octopus. The cold glass arms and fake candles. My arms and legs tangle in strands of crystal chain. The dusty crystal bobs, the cobwebs and dead spiders. A hot light bulb burns through my This high above the floor, I panic and grab hold of a swooping glass arm and the whole sparkling mess rocks and shakes while wind chimes. Flashing bits clatter to the floor below. All of it with me inside pitches back and forth. And Helen says, stop, I'm going to ruin it. And she's next to me, floating just behind a shimmering curtain of crystal. Her lips move with quiet words. Helen's pink fingernails part the beads, and she smiles in at me, saying, let's get you right side first. The book's gone, and she holds the crystals to one side and swims closer. I'm gripping a glass chandelier arm in both hands. The flipping bits of it shake with my every heartbeat. Pretend you're underwater, she says. Ties my she slips the shoe and it drops. With her stained hand, she unties my other shoe, and the first shoe clatters on the floor. Here, she says, and slips her arms under mine. Take off your jacket. She drops my jacket out of the chandelier, then my tie. She slips down her own jacket and lets it fall. Around us, the chandelier is a shimmery million bows of lead crystal, warm with a hundred tiny light bulbs. The burning smell of dust on all those hot hot light bulbs, all bubbling and shivering. We're floating here in the hollow center. We're floating in nothing but light and heat. Helen mouths her silent words and my heart feels full of warm water. Helen's earrings, all her jewelry is blazing bright. All you can hear is the tinkling chimes around us. We sway less and less, and I start to let go. A million bright stars around us. This is how it must feel to be God. And this, you, is my love. I say, I need to play from the police. I don't know what to do next. Holding out her hand, Helen says, here. And I take it. And she doesn't let go. And we kiss. And it's nice. And as 
For now, you can stay here. She flicks a pink fingernail against a gleaming glass ball, cut and fastened to throw light in a thousand directions. She says, from now on, we can do anything, she says. Anything. And toes peel off my socks. We kiss and I open the buttons down the back of her blouse. My socks, her blouse, my her panties. Some things drop to the floor far below us. Some things snag and hang from the bottom of the chandelier. My swollen, infected foot, Helen's crabby oysters attack. There's no way to hide these from each other. It's been 20 years, but here I am, somewhere I've never dreamed I'd be in, and I say, I'm falling in love. And Helen, blazing smooth and hot in the center of light, smiles and rolls her head back, saying, that's the idea. I'm in love with her, in love with Hoover Boyle. My pants and her skirt flutter down into the heap. The fallen crystals are shoes all on the floor with the grim. Chapter 38. At the offices of Helen Hoover Boyle Realty, the doors are locked. And when I knock, Mona shouts to the glass, we're not open. And I shout, I'm not a customer. Inside, she's sitting at her computer, keyboarding something. Every couple keystrokes, Mona looks in and forth between the keys and the screen. On the screen, at the top in big letters, it says, Resume. Police scanners the code 912. Still keyboarding, Mona says, I don't know why I shouldn't charge you with assault. Maybe because she cares about me and Helen, I say. And Mona says, no, that's not it. Maybe she won't with a whistle because she still wants the grimoire. And Mona says, doesn't say anything. She just turns her chair and pulls up of her peasant block. The skin on her ribs under her arms is white with purple blotches. Tough love. Through the Helen's office, Helen says, what's another word for tormented? Her desk is covered with open books. Under her desk, she's wearing one pink shoe and one yellow shoe, pink silk sofa. Mona's carved Louis the 14th desk, the lion lakes of the table. It's all frosted dust. The flower arrangements are withered and brown, standing in black, stinking water. The police scanner says a code 311. I say, I'm sorry. Grabbing her wasn't right. I pinch the crease in my pant legs and pull them up to show her purple bruises on my shoes. That's different, Mona says. I was defending myself. I stamp my foot a couple of times and say my infections got a lot better. I say, thank you. And Helen says, Mona, what's another way of saying butchered? Mona says, on your way out, we need to have a little talk. In the inner office, Helen's face down in an open book. It's a Hebrew dictionary. Next to it is a guide to Latin. Under that is a book about Aramaic. Next to that is an unfolded copy of a calling spell. The trash can next to the desk is filled with paper coffee cups. I say, hey, and Helen looks. There's a coffee stain on her green lap. The grimoire is open next to the Hebrew dictionary, and Helen blinks once, twice, three, and says, Mr. Stratter, I ask if she'd like to go get some lunch. I still need to go up against John Nash to confront him. I think he might give me something for an edge, an invisib invisibility spell maybe, or a mind control spell, maybe something so I won't have to kill him. I come around so to see she's waiting. And Helen slides a sheet of paper on top of the grimoire saying, I'm a little occupied today. With a pen in hand, she waits. With the other hand, she shuts the dictionary. And she says, shouldn't you be hiding from the police? And I say, how about a movie? She says, not this weekend. I say, how about I get us tickets to the symphony? 
And Helen waves the hand between us and says, do what you want. And I say, great, then it's a date. Helen puts her pen in the pink hair behind her ear. She opens another place on top of the Hebrew book. One finger holding her place in a dictionary, Helen looks up and says, it's not that I don't like you. It's just very, very busy right now. In the open grimoire, sticking out from one edge of it, is a name. Written in the margin of the page is today's name. Today's assassination target. It says, Carl Strenator. Helen closes the grimoire and says, you understand. The scanner says, a code 27. I ask if she's coming to see me tonight. In the guard troller house. Standing in the doorway to her office, I say, I can't wait to be with her again. I need her. And Helen smiles and says, the idea. In the outer office, Mona catches me around the waist. She picks up her purse and loops the strap over her shoulder, yelling, Helen, I'm going out for lunch. To me, she says, we need to talk, but outside. She unlocks the door to let us out. In the parking lot, in my car, Mona shakes, saying, you have no idea what's happening, do you? I'm in love, so kill me. Helen, she says, snaps her fingers in my face and says, you're not in love. She sighs and says, have you heard of a love spell? For whatever reason, Nash screwing dead woman comes to mind. Helen's found a spell to trap you, Mona says. You're in her power. You don't really love her. I don't? Mona stares into my eyes and says, when was the last time you thought about Grimoire? She points at the ground and says, this, what you call love? It's just her way of dominating you. A car drives parks and inside his oyster. He just shakes the hair back off, off of his eyes and sits in the steering wheel watching us. The shattered blonde hair exploded in every direction. Two deep parallel lines slash scars run across each cheek. Dark red war paint. His cell phone rings and Oyster answers it. Dolan, Diz, and Dorn agrees at law. The big power grab. But I love Helen. No, Mona says. She glances at Oyster. You just think you do. She's tricked you. But it's love. I've known Helen a lot longer than you have, Mona says. She folds her arms and looks at her wristwatch. It's love. It's a beautiful, sweet spell, but she's making you into her slave. Chapter 30. Experts in ancient Greek culture say people back then didn't see this as to them. When they had a thought, it occurred to them as a god or goddess giving them an order. Apollo was telling them to be brave. Athena was telling them to fall in love. Now people hear a commercial for sour cream potato chips and rush out to buy. Between television and radio and Helen Hoover Boyle's magic spells, I don't know what I want anymore. I don't even believe myself. I don't know. That night, Helen drives us to the antique store, the big warehouse. She's mutilated so much furniture. It's dark, but she presses her hand over a lock and says a quick poem, and the door swings open. No burglar alarm sounds. Nothing. We've wandered deep into the maze of furniture with dark, disconnected chandeliers hanging above us. Moonlight glows in through the skylights. See how easy, Helen says, we can do anything. No, I say, he can do anything. Helen says, do you still love me? If she wants me to, I don't know. If she says so, Helen looks up the looming chandeliers, the hanging cage of gill and crystal, and she says, got time for a quick. And I say, it's not like I have a choice. 
I don't know the difference between what I want and what I'm trained to want. I can't tell what I really want and what I've been tricked into wanting. Talk about his free will. Or does God dictate and script everything we do and say and want? Or do the mass media rules our desires and actions from the moment that we're born? I have it, or is my mind the control of Helen's spell? Standing in front of the Regency armoire in burled walnut with a huge mirror on the door, Helen strokes the carved scrolls and garlands and says, Become Immortal with me. Like this fur, traveling through life after life, watching everyone who loves us die. Parasites. Our Mars, Helen and I, the cockroaches of our culture. Guard across the mirror door is an old gouge slashed from her diamond ring. From back when she hated this immortal joke. Imagine immortality, where even a marriage of 50 years would feel like a one-night stand. Imagine seeing trends and fashions blur past you. Imagine the world more crowded and, despair and desperate every century. Imagine changing religions, homes, diet, careers, until none of them have any real value. Imagine in the world until you're bored with every inch. Imagine your emotions, your loves and hates and rivalries and victories played out in, again and again until life is nothing more than a melodramatic soap opera. Until you regard the birth and death of other people with no more emotion than a wilted cut flower you throw away. I tell Helen, I think we're immortal already. She says, I have the power. She snaps open her purse and fishes out a sheet of folded paper. She shakes paper open and says, do you know about scrying? I don't know what I know. What I doubt it. I say, tell me. Helen slips a silk scarf from around her neck. It's the dusty mirror door of the arm. We see armoire with inlaid olive wood carvings and second empire. And she says, witches spread oil on a mirror. Then they read a spell and they can and then they could read the future in the mirror. The future I say girl. Nile perch. Even I can read the present. Helen holds up the paper and reads in the voice for the flying. It's a few quick lines. She lowers the paper and says, Mirror, mirror, tell us what the future will be if we love each other and use our new power. Her new power. I made up the mirror, mirror part, Helen says. She slips her hand around mine and squeezes, but I don't squeeze back. She says, I tried this at the office with the mirror in my compact, and it was like watching vision through a microscope. In the mirror, our reflections blur. The shapes swim together. The reflection mixes into an even gray. Tell us, Helen says, show us picture together. And the shapes appear in the gray. Light and shadow swim together. See, she says, there we are, young again. I can do that. You look like you did in the newspaper, the wedding photo. Everything's so unfocused. I don't know what I see. And look, Helen says, she tosses her to the mirror. We're ruling the world. We've found a dynasty. But what's enough? I can hear oysters. Him and his overpopulated talk. 
power, money, food, sex, love? Can we ever get enough or will get make us crave even more? Inside the shifting mess of the future, I can't recognize anything. I can't see anything except just more problems, more people, less biodiversity, more suffering. I see us together forever, she says. I say, if that's what she wants. And Helen says, what's that supposed to mean? Just whatever she wants it to mean, I say. She's the one pulling the strings here. She's the one planting her little seeds, colonizing me, occupying me. The mass media, the culture, everything lays eggs under my skin. Big brother filling me with need. Do I really want a big house? car, a thousand beautiful sex partners? Do I really want these things or am I trained to want them? Are these things really better than the things I already have? Or am I just trained to be dissatisfied with what I have now? Am I under a spell that says nothing is ever good enough? The gray in the mirror is mixing, swirling. It could be anything. No matter what the future holds, ultimately it will be a disappointment. And Helen takes my other hand. Holding both my hands in hers, she pulls me around saying, look at me, she says. Did Mona say something? I say, you love you. I just don't want to be used anymore. Above us are the chandeliers, wing silver in the moonlight. What did Mona say, Helen says. And I'm counting one, counting two, counting three. Don't do this, Helen says. I love you. Squeezing my hand, she says, do not shut me out. I'm counting four, counting five, counting six. You're being just like my husband, she says. I just want you to be happy. That's easy, I say. Just put a happy spell on me. And Helen says, there's no such spell, she says. Drugs that. I don't want to keep making the world worse. I want to try and clean up this man, the population, the environment. The culling spell, the same magic that ruins my life is supposed to fix it. But we can do that, Helen says, with more spells. Spells to fix spells to fix spells to fix spells. And life just gets more miserable in ways we never imagined. That's the future I see in the mirror. Mr. Eugene Shefflin and his starlings, Spencer Baird and his carp. History is filled with brilliant people who wanted to fix things and just made them worse. I want to burn the grimoire. And I told Mona said about how she's put a spell on to make me, to make me her immortal love slave for all of eternity. Mona's lying, Helen says. How do I know that? Whom do I believe? The gray in the mirror, the future? Maybe it's not clear to me because nothing's clear to me. And Helen drops my hands. She waves her hands at the Regency armoires, the federal desks, the Indian Renaissance coat racks and says, so if reality is all a spell and you don't really want what you think you want, she pushes her face in my face and says, if you have no free will, you don't know what you know. You don't really love who you only think you love. What do you have to live for? Nothing. This is just us standing here with all the furniture watching. Think of deep outer space, the cold and quiet where your wife and kid wait. And I say, please, I tell me her cell phone. The gray still shifting and liquid in the mirror. Helen snaps open her purse and hands me the phone. I flip it open and nine one one. 
And a woman's voice says, police, fire, or medical? And I say, medical. Your location, the voice says. And I tell her the address of the bar on 3rd Nine, the bar near the hospital. And the nature of your medical emergency? For cheerleaders overcome with fashion, a woman's volleyball team needing mouth to mouth, a crew of fashion models wanting breast examinations, her if they've got emergency med tech named John, John Nash, he's the one to send. I tell her if they can't find Nash, not to bother. The phone back. She looks at me once, twice, three times, slow and says, what are you up to? What I have left, maybe the only way to find freedom is by doing things I don't want to. Stop Nash. Confess to the police. Accept my punishment. I need to rebel against myself. It's the opposite of following your bliss. I need to do what I most fear. Chapter 40. Nash is eating a bowl of chili. He's at the back table in the bar on 3rd Avenue. The bartender is slumped forward on the bar, his arms still swinging above the bar stools. Two men and two women are face down at a booth table. Their cigarettes still burn in the ashtray, only half burned down. Another man is laid out in the doorway to the bathrooms. Another man is dead, stretched out on the pool table, the cue still clutched in his hands. Behind the bar, there's a radio blaring static in the kitchen. Somebody is in a greasy ear and is face down in the grill among the hamburgers, the grill popping and smoking and the sweet, greasy smoke from the guys rolling out along. The candle on Nash's table is the only light in the place, and Nash looks up, chilly around his mouth, and says, I need a little privacy for this. He's wearing a white uniform. A dead body nearby is wearing the same uniform. My partner, Nash says, nodding at the body. As he nods, a little black palm tree flops around the top of his head. Red chili stains run down the front of his uniform. Nash says, his long overdue. Behind me, the street door opens and a man steps in. He stands there, looking around. He waves a hand through the smoke and looks around, saying, What the fuck? The street door shuts behind him, and Nash tucks his chin and fishes two fingers inside his chest pocket. He white sex card smeared with red and yellow food, and he reads the culling song. His words flat as someone howling out loud at Helen. The man in the doorway, his eyes roll up white. His knees buckle and he slumps to one side. I just stand there. Nash tucks the index card back in his pocket and says, Now, where were we? So I say, where did he find the poem? And Nash says, yes. He says, I got it the only place where you can't destroy it. And he picks up a bottle of beer and points the long at me saying, Think, he says, think hard. The book, poems and rhymes from around the world will always be out there for people to hiding in plain sight. Just this one place, he says, no one can ever be rooted out. For whatever reason, cheatgrass comes to mind and zebra mussels and oyster. Nash drinks some beer and sets it down and says, think hard. I say, the fashion models, the killings. I say, what he's doing is wrong. And Nash says, you give up. He has to see that having sex with dead women is wrong. Nash picks up his spoon and says, the good old lady of Congress, your tax dollars at work. Damn. He digs the spoon into the bowl of chili. He puts the spoon in his mouth. Says, and don't lecture me about the evils of necrophilia, he says. You're about the last person who can give that lecture. A full of chili, Nash says. I know who you are. He swallows and says, you're still wanted for questioning. He licks 
He smeared around his lips and says, I saw your wife's death certificate. He smiles and says, signs of post-mortem sexual intercourse. Nash points to an empty chair. Don't tell me. He leans across the table and says, don't tell me it wasn't just about sex you've ever had. And I say, shut up. You can't kill me, Nash says. He crumbles a handful of crackers in his said, you and me were exactly alike. And I say it was different. She was my wife. Your wife or not, Nash says, dead means dead. It's still necrophilia. Nash dabs a spoon around in the crackers and red and says, you killing me would be the same as you killing me. I say, shut up. I laughed, he says. I didn't give nobody a letter about this. Nash crunches a mouthful of crackers and red. That would have been stupid, he says. I mean, think. And he shoves in more chili. All they'd have to do is read it. I don't need the competition. Important messy. This is the world I live in. This far from God. These are the people I'm left with. Everybody grabbing for power. And Helen and Nash and Oyster. The only people who know me hate me. We all hate each other. We all fear each other. The whole world is my enemy. You and me, Nash says, we can't trust anybody. Welcome to hell. If Mona is right, call Marx's words coming out of her mouth, then killing Nash would be safe. Reaching him to God, connecting him to humanity by resolving his sins. My eyes meet his eyes, and Nash start to move. His breath nothing but chill. He sang the culling song. As hard as a dog barks, he said each word, so hard that chili bubbles out around his mouth. Drops of red fly out. He stops and looks into his chest pocket. His hand digs to find his index card. With two fingers, he holds it and starts to read. The card is so smeared, he rubs it on the cloth and starts to read again. It sounds heavy and rich. It's the sound of doom. My eyes relax and the world burns into unfocused gray. All my muscles go smooth and long. My eyes roll up and my knees start to fold. This is how it feels to die, to be saved. By now, killing is a reflex. It's the way I solve everything. My knees fold and hit the floor in three stages. My ass, my back, my head. As fast as a belch, a sneeze, a yawn from deep inside me, the culling song whips through my mind. The powder keg of all my unresolved shit, it never fails me. The goes back into focus, flat on my back on the bar floor, the greasy gray smoke roll along the ceiling. You can hear the guy's face dying. Nash, his two feet at the car drop on the table. His eyes roll up, his shoulders heave, face lands in the bowl of red. red flies everywhere, the bulk of his body in his white uniform, it heaves over and Nash hits the floor next to me, his eyes look into my eyes, his face smeared with chili, his ponytail, the little black palm tree, on top of his head, it's come loose, and the stringy black hair hangs limp across his cheeks and forehead. He's saved, but I'm not. The greasy smoke over me, the grill popping and sizzling. I pick up Nash's index card off the floor and hold it over the candle on the table, adding smoke to the smoke, and I just watch it burn. A siren goes off, the smoke alarm. So loud I can't hear myself think, as if I ever think, as if I could think. The siren fills me, big brother. It occupies my mind the way an army does it. While I sit and wait for the police to save me, to deliver me to God and unite me with humanity, the siren wails, drowning out everything. And I'm glad. 
Chapter 41. This is after the police read me my rights, after they cuff my hands behind my back and show the precinct. This is after the first patrolman arrived at the scene, looked at the dead bodies and said, sweet suffering Christ. After the paramedics rolled the dead cook off the grill, took one look at his fried face and puked in their own cupped hands. This is after the police gave me my own phone call. And I called Helen and I said, I was sorry, but this was it. I was arrested. And Helen said, don't worry, I'll save you. After they fingerprinted me and took a mugshot, after they confiscated my wallet and keys and watch, they put my clothes, my brown sports coat in a plastic bag tagged with my new criminal number. After the police walked me down a cold, sinful hallway, naked, into a cold concrete room. After they leave me alone with a beefy, buzz cut old officer, hands the size of a catcher's mitt, alone in a room with nothing but a desk, my bag of clothes, and a jar of petroleum jelly. After I'm alone with this grizzling old ox, he pulls on latex gloves and says, please turn to the wall, bend over, and use your hands to spread your ass cheeks. And I say, what? And this big frowning giant wipes two glove fingers on the jar of petroleum jelly and says, cavity search. He says, now turn around. And I'm counting one, counting two, counting three. I turn around, I bend over, one hand gripping each half of my ass. I pull them apart. I'm counting four, counting five, counting six, me and my failed ethics, the same as Walter Wagner and Jeff and Bundy. I'm a serial killer, and this is how my punishment starts, proof of my free will. This is my salvation and the cop's voice, all rough with the smell of cigarettes. He says, Standard procedure for all detainees that are dangerous. I'm counting seven, counting eight, counting nine, and the top and the cop growls. And I feel a slight pressure, so just relax. And I'm counting ten, counting eleven, counting damn, damn. Relax, the cop says. Damn, damn. Damn, damn, damn. It's worse than Mona poking me with the red hot tweezers. It's worse than the rubbing alcohol washing away my blood. I grip the two handful of my ass and grit my teeth. The sweat running down my legs. Sweat from my forehead drips off my nose. My breathing stops. The drips fall straight down and splash between my bare feet. My planet wide apart. Something huge and hard twists deeper into me, and the cop's horrible voice says, yeah, relax. Counting 12, counting 13. The twisting stops, the huge hard thing backs off, slow, almost all the way. Then it twists in deep again, slow as the hour hand on a clock, then faster. The cop's greased fingers prod in me, retreat, prod in, retreat. And close to me, the cops gravel and the old voice says, hey, buddy, you got time for a quickie? And my body does that. And the cop says, hey, somebody's got tight. Somebody's just got tight. I say, officer, please, you have no idea. I could kill you. Please don't do this. And the cop says, let go of me so I can unlock your handcuffs. It's me, Helen. Helen? Helen Hoover Boyle, remember? The cops, two nights ago, you were doing almost the exact same thing to me inside a chandelier. Helen Hoover Boyle, remember? The cop says, two nights ago, Helen, the huge, hard something still stood deep inside me. The cop says, 
This is called an occupational spell. I translated it just a couple hours ago. I've got officer whoever here crammed down into his subconscious right now. I'm running his show. The hard, cold soul of the officer's shoe shoves against my ass, and the huge, hard fingers yank themselves out. Between my feet is a puddle of sweat. Still gritting my teeth, I stand up fast. The officer looks at his fingers and says, I thought I would lose these. He smells the fingers and makes a nasty face. Great, I say, deep, eyes closed. First, she's controlling me. Now I have to worry about Helen controlling everyone around me. And the cop said, I had control of Mona for the last couple of night hours this afternoon. Just to give the spell a test run and to get even with her for scaring you. I gave her a little mirror. The cop grabs his crotch. This is amazing. Being with you like this, you're giving me an erection, he says. This sounds sexist, but I've always wanted to have a penis. I say, I don't want to hear this. And Helen says, through the cop's mouth, I think as soon as I put you into a taxi, maybe I'll hang around on in this guy and beat off, just for the experience. And I say, you think that will make you love me? If that, and I say, if you think this will make me love you, think again. A tear runs down the cop's cheek. Standing here naked, I say, I don't want you. I can't trust you. You can't love me, the cop says. Helen says in the cop's grizzled voice, because I have more power than you. And I say, let's go, Helen. Get the fuck out of here. I don't need you. I don't want to pay for my crimes. I want to pay for my crimes. I'm tired of making the world wrong to justify my own bad behavior. And the cop's crying hard. And another cop walks in. It's a young cop. And he looks from the old cop crying to me naked. The young cop says, Every okay in here, Sarge? It's just delightful. The old cop says, wiping his eyes. We're having a wonderful time. He sees he's wiped his eyes with his hand, the fingers out of my ass, and he tears off the glove with a little scream. His whole body does a big shudder, and he throws the grease glove across the room. I tell the young cop, we were just having a little talk, and the young cop puts a fist in my face and says, you the fuck up. The old cop Sarge sits down on the edge of the desk and crosses his legs at the knee. He sniffs back tears and tosses his head as if he's tossing back hair and says, now, if you don't mind, we'd very much like to be alone. And I just look at the ceiling. The young cop says, sure thing, Sarge. And Sarge grabs a tissue and dabs his eyes. Then the young cop turns fast, grabbing me under the jaw, jamming up against the wall and lay Against the cold concrete. With my head pushed up and back, the young cop's hand squeezing my throat says, don't give the Sarge a hard time. He shouts, got that? And the Sarge looks up with a weak smile and says, yeah, you heard him. And sniffs. Blood's loose in my throat. He steps back toward the door saying, I'll be out front if you need well, anything. Thank you. The Sarge says, he clutches the young cop's hand, squeezing it, saying, you're too sweet. And the young cop jerks his hand away and leaves the room. Helen's inside this man, the way a television plants its seeds in you, the way cheap grass takes over a landscape, the way a song stays in your head, the way ghosts haunts houses, the way a germ infects you the way it occupies your attention. The Sarge, Helen, gets to its feet. He fiddles with his holster and pulls out his gun. Holding the pistol in both hands, he points it at me and says, now get your clothes out of the bag and put them on. The Sarge sniffs back tears and kicks the garbage bag of clothes at me and says, get dressed, damn it, he says. I came here to save you. The pistol trembling. Sarge says, 
I want you out of here so I can beat off. Chapter 42. Everywhere words are mixing. Words and lyrics and dialogue are mixing in a soup that can trigger a chain reaction. Maybe acts of God are just a nation of media junk thrown out into the air. The wrong words collide and call up an earthquake. The way words is called storms. The right words might call down tornadoes. Too many advertising jingles co-mingling could be behind global warming. Too many television reruns bouncing around might cause hurricanes, cancer, AIDS. In the taxi, on my way to the Helen Boyle real estate office, I see newspaper headlines mixing with hand-lettered signs. Leaflets stapled to telephone poles mixed with third-class mail. The songs of street busker mix with music, mix with stalkers, mix with talk radio. We're living in a teetering table, Tower of Babel. The shaky reality of words, a DNA soup for disaster. The natural world destroyed, We're left with this cluttered world of luggage. Big Brother is singing and dancing, and we're left to watch. Sticks and stones may break our bones, but our role is just to be a guardian, to just pay our attention and wait for the disaster. Against the taxi, my ass still feels greasy, stretched out. There are 33 copies of the poem's book left to find. We need to visit the Library of Congress. We need to mop the mess and make sure it will never happen again. We need to warn people. My life is over. This is my new life. The taxi pulls into the parking lot and Mona is outside the front doors, locking them with a huge ring of keys. For a minute, she could be Mona, her hair's ratted, back comb teased into a red and black bubble. She's wearing a brown suit, but not chocolate. It's more brown chocolate he truffles served on a satin pillow in a luxury hotel. The box sits on the ground at Mona's feet. On the top of the box is something red, a book, the grimoire. I'm walking in the parking lot and she calls, Helen, not here. There was something on the police scanner about everybody in a bar on 3rd Avenue being, Mona says, and me being arrested. Putting the box in the trunk of her car, she says, you just missed Mrs. Boyle. She ran out of here sobbing just a minute ago. The Sarge. Helen's big, leather-smelling realtor's car is nowhere in sight. Looking down at her own brown high heels, her tailored suit, padded and tucked, doll clothes with huge topaz buttons, her short skirt, and says, don't ask me how this happened. She holds up her hands, her black fingernails painted pink with white tips. Mona said, please tell Mrs. Boyle I don't appreciate having my body kidnapped and shit done to me. She points at her own stiff bubble of hair, her blusher cheeks and pink lipstick and says, this is the equivalent of a fashion rape. With her new pink fingernails, Mona slams the trunk lid. Pointing at my shirt, she says, did things with your friend get a little bloody? The red stains are chilly, I tell her. Grimoire, I say, I saw it. The woman skin, the pentagram tattoo. She gave it to me, Mona says. She snaps open her little brown purse, speeches inside saying she, she wouldn't need it anymore. Like I said, she was upset. She was crying. With two pink fingernails, Mona folded paper out of hers. It's a, it's a page from the grimoire the page with my name written on it, and she holds it out to me saying, take care of yourself. I guess somebody in some comment want you dead. Mona says, I guess Helen's a little love spell must have backfired. She stumbles in her round wheels, leaving the car, she says, believe it or not, we're doing this to save you. Two steps, two 
to be alive. His shattered blonde hair spreads across the street, the sea. Holy man bag still hanging, his cigarettes falling out of it. The red scars across his cheeks from Helen's eyes. And Mona says, you wish, she says, no, he'll be okay. She gets into the dress, starts the car saying, hurry and go find Helen. I think she might do something desperate. She slams her car door and starts to back out the parking space. Through her car window, Mona yells, check at the new content, the new continuum medical center. She drives off yelling, I told you too late. Chapter 43. In room 131 at the new continuum medical center, the floor sparkles. The linoleum tile snaps and pops as I walk across it, across the shards and slivers of red, green, yellow, the drops of red, the diamond, rubies, emeralds, and sapphires, both Helen's shoes, the pink and the yellow, the heels are hammered down to mush, the ruined shoes left in the middle of the room. Helen stands on the far side of the room in a little lamp light just the edge of some light from a table lamp. She's on a cabinet made of stainless steel. Her hands are spread against the steel. She presses her. My shoes snap and crush the colors on the floor and Helen turns. There's a smear of blood across her pink lipstick. On the cabinet is the kiss in red where she was lying in a blurry gray window and inside something too perfect to be alive. Patrick. The frost around the edges of the window has started to melt and water down the cabin. And Helen said, you're here. Her voice is blurry and thick. Blood spills out of her mouth. Just looking at her, my foot aches. I'm okay, I say. And Helen says, I'm glad. Her cosmetic case is dumped out on the floor. Among the shards of the color are twisted chains and settings, gold and platinum. Helen says, I tried to break the biggest ones and she coughs into her hand. The rest I had to chew, she says, and coughs until her palm is filled with blood and slivers of white. Next to the cosmetic case, a spilled bottle of liquid drain cleaner. The spill of puddle around it. Her teeth are shattered, bloody gaps and bits show inside her mouth. She puts her face against the gray window, her breath fogging the glass. Her bloody hand goes to the side of her skirt. I go back to how it was before, she said, the way my life was before I met you. She wipes her bloody hand and keeps wiping it on her skirt, even with all the power in the world. I say, we need to get her to a hospital. And Helen smiles a blue smile and says, this is a hospital. It's nothing personal, she says. She just needed someone. Even if she could bring Patrick, she'd never want to ruin his life by sharing the culling spell. Even if it meant living alone again, she'd never want Patrick to have that power. Look at him, she says, and touches the gray glass with her pink. Nails. He's so perfect. She swallows blood and shattered diamonds and teeth and makes a wrinkled face. Her hands clutch her stomach and she leans on the steel cabinet, the gray window. Blood and concentration run down from the little window. With one hand shaking, Helen snaps open her purse and takes out a lipstick. She touches it around her lips and the pink lipstick comes away smeared with blood. She says she's unplugged the, the cryogenic unit, disconnected the alarm and backup batteries. She wants to die with Patrick. She wants it to end here. The culling spell, the power, the loneliness. She wants to destroy all the jewels that people think will save them. All the residue that outlasts the talent and intelligence and beauty. All the decorative junk left behind by real accomplishment and success. She wants to destroy 
all the lovely parasites that outlive their human hosts. The perps out her hands on the floor. Gray rock rolls out of her purse. For whatever reason, oyster comes signed. Helen belches. She takes the tissue from her purse and cups it under her mouth and spits out blood and bile and broken emeralds. Fishing inside her mouth, stuck in the shredded meat gums are jagged pink sapphires and shattered orange barrels. In the roof of her mouth are fragments of purple spinels. Sunk in her tongue are shards of black bort diamond. And Helen smiles and says, I want to be with my family. She wraps the bloody tissue into a ball and tucks it inside the cuff of her suit. Her earrings and necklaces, her rings, it's all gone. The details of her suit are, it's some color. It's a suit. It's rude. She says, please, hold me. Inside the gray window, the perfect infant is curled on its side, a pillow of white plastic, one thumb in its mouth, perfect and pale as blue ice. I put my arms around Helen and she... Her knees start to fold. Before. Helen Hoover Boyle closes her eyes. She says, thank you, Mr. Stradiner. With a gray rock in my fist, I punch through the cold gray window. My hands bleeding, I lift out Patrick, cold and pale. My blood on Patrick. I put him in Helen's arms. I put my arms around Helen. My blood in hers mixed now. Lying in my arms, closes her eyes, grinds her head into my lap. She smiles and says, Didn't it feel too coincidental when Mona found the grimoire? Leering at me, she opens her eyes and says, wasn't it just a little too neat and tidy that we'd be traveling along with the grim old time? Helen lying in my arms, she cradles Patrick. Then it happens. She reaches up and Helen looks up at me and smiles with just half her mouth, a leer with blood and green bile between her lips. She winks and says, gotcha, dad. My whole body, one muscle spasm wet with sweat. Helen says, did you really think mom would off herself over you and trash her precious freaking jewels and thaw this frozen piece of meat? She laughs, blood and drain cleaner bubbling in her throat. She says, did you really think mom wouldn't chew own fucking diamonds because you didn't love her? I say oyster? In the flesh, Helen says. Oyster says in his mouth. Helen's voice. Well, I'm in Mrs. Boyle's flesh, but I bet you've been inside herself. Helen raises in her hands. Her child, cold and blue as porcelain. Fragile, frozen fragile as glass. And she tosses the dead child across the room where it clatters against the steel cabinet and falls to the floor, spinning all the, on the lonely own. A frozen arm breaks off. Patrick, the spinning body hits the steel cabinet corner and the legs snap off. Patrick, the armless, legless body, a broken doll. It spins against the wall and the head breaks off. And Helen winks and says, come on, don't flatter yourself. And I say, damn you. Oyster occupies Helen the way an army occupies a city, the way Helen occupied Sarge, the way the past, the media, the world occupy you. Helen says, Oyster through Helen's mouth. Mona's known about the grimoire for weeks now. The first time she saw mom's planner, she knew, he says. She just couldn't tram it. Oyster says, my thing is music and Mona's thing is, well, stupidity is Mona's thing. With Helen's voice. Afternoon, Mona woke up in some beauty salon getting her nails painted pink, he says. She stormed back to the office. She found Mrs. Boyle face 
Ask in some kind of coma. Helen shudders and grabs her stomach. She says, open in front of me oil was a translated spell called an occupation spell. In fact, all the spells were translated. She says, Oyster says, God bless mom and her cross. She's in here somewhere mad as hell. Oyster says through Helen's mouth says, say hi to mom for me. The brittle blue statue, the frozen baby is shattered, broken among the broken jewels, a busted off here, a broken off leg, the, the shattered head. I say, so now he and Mona are going to kill everybody and become Adam and Eve. Every generation wants to be the last. Not everybody, Helen says. We're going to need some slaves. With Helen's bloody hands, he reaches down and pulls her skirt up. Grabbing her crotch, he says, maybe you and mom will have time for a quickie before she's toast. And I heave Helen's body off my lap and my whole body aching than my foot ever ached. Helen cries out a little scream as she slides to the floor and curled there on the cold linoleum with the shattered gems and of Patrick, she says, Carl, she puts a hand to her mouth, feels the jewels embedded there. She twists to look at me and says, Carl, Carl, where am I? She sees the stainless steel cabinet, the broken gray window. She sees the little blue arms, then the legs, the head, and she no, spraying blood, Helen says, no, no, no. And crawling through the sharp slivers of color, her voice thick and blurred from her ruined teeth, she grabs all the pieces, sobbing, vile, the room she clutches the broken blue pieces. The hands and tiny feet, the crushed torso and dented head, she hugs them to her chest and screams, oh, Patch. Patty, she screams, oh my Patty, Pat, Pat, no. Seeing the dented blue head, squeezing it to her breast, she asks, what's happening? Carl, help me. She stares at me until her aunt bends her in half and she sees the empty bottle of liquid drain cleaner. Oh God, Carl, help me, she says, clutching her child and rocking God, please tell her how I got, please tell me how I got here. And I go to her. I take her in my arms and say, at first, the new owner pretends he never looked at the room floor, never really looked. Not the first time they toured the house, not when the inspector showed them through it. They measured rooms and told the movers where to set the couch and piano hauled in everything they owned and never really stopped to look at the living room floor. They pretended. Helen's head is nodding forward over Patrick, the blood drooling from her mouth. Her arms are longer, spilling little fingers and toes onto the floor. In another moment, I'll be alone. This is my life. And I swear no matter where or when, I'll track down Oyster and Mona. What's good is this only takes a minute. It's an old song about animals going to sleep. It's wistful and sentimental, and my face feels livid and hot, oxygenated hemoglobin while I say the poem out loud. Under the fluorescent lights with the loose bundle of Helen in my arms, leaning back against the steel cabinet. Patrick's covered in my blood, covered in her blood, her mouth is open a little. Her glittering teeth are real diamonds. Helen Hoover Boyle, her eyes were blue. My job is to notice the details, to be an impartial witness, always research. My job isn't to feel anything. It's called a calling song. In some ancient cultures, they sing to children famines or droughts, any time the tribe had outgrown its land. It was sung to warriors injured in accidents or the very old or anyone dying. It was used to end misery and pain. It's a lullaby. 
I say everything will be all right. I hold Helen rocking her, telling her rest now, telling her everything is be just fine. Chapter 44. When I am 20 years old, I was married to a woman named Gina Dingy. And that was supposed to be the rest of my life. A year later, we had a daughter named Catherine, and she was supposed to be the rest of my life. Then Gina and Catherine died, and I ran and became Carl Stoner, and I became a jerk. And for 20 more years, that was my life. After that, well, you already know what happened. How long I held on to Helen Hoover Boyle, I don't know. After long enough, it was just her body. It was so long she stopped bleeding. By then, in parts of Patrick Boyle still cradled in her arms, they thawed enough to start bleeding. By then, footsteps arrived outside the door to room 131. The door opened. Me still sitting on the floor, Helen and Patrick dead in my arms. The door opens, and it's the grizzled old Irish cop, Sarge. And I say, please. Please put me in jail. I'll put it to anything. I killed, I killed my kid. I'm Walter Wagner, the angel of death. Kill me so I can be with Helen again. And the Sarge says, we need to get him, move on. He steps from the doorway to the steel cabinet. On a pad of paper, he writes something in a pen. He tears out the note and hands it to me. His wrinkled hand is spotted with moles, carpeted with gray hairs, his fingernails thick and yellow. Please forgive me for my own life, the note says. I'm with my son now. It's Helen's handwriting, the same as in her planner book, The Grimoire. It's signed, Helen Hoover Boyle, in her exact handwriting. And I look from the body in my arms, the blood in your vomit to Sarge standing there and say, Helen? In the flesh, the Sarge says. Helen says, well, not my own flesh. He and looks at Helen's body dead in my lap. He looks at his own wrinkled hands and says, I hate ready to wear, but any in a storm. So this is how we're on the road again. Sometimes I worry that Sarge really is Oyster, pretending to be Helen, occupying the search. When I sleep with whoever this is, I pretend it's Mona or Gina. So it all comes out even. According to Mona Sabat, people who eat or drink too much, people addicted to drugs or sex or stealing, they're really controlled by spirits that love those things too much to quit after death. Drunks, those possessed evil spirits. You are the culture medium, the host. Some people still think they can run their own lives. You possessed. We're all of us haunting and haunted. Something is always living itself through you. Your whole life is the vehicle for something to come to earth. An evil spirit, a theory, a marketing campaign, a political strategy, a religious doctrine. Driving me away from the new medical center and squad car, the Sarge says, they have the occupation spell and the flying spell. He ticks off each spell by holding up another finger. They'll have a reaction spell, but it only works on animals. Don't ask me why, he says, she says. They have a rain spell and a sun spell, a fertility spell to grow, a spell to communicate with animals. Not looking at me, looking at his fingers spread on the steering wheel, the Sarge says, do not have a love spell. So I'm really in love with Helen, a woman in a man's body. We don't have hot sex anymore, but as Nash would say, how is that different than most love relationships after long enough? Mona and Oyster have the grimoire, but they don't have the culling song. The grimoire page that Mona gave me, the one with the name written in the margin, it's the song. Along the bottom of the page is written, I want to save the world too, but not Oyster's way. It's signed, Mona. They don't have the culling song, the Sarge says, Helen says, but they have the spell. 
a shield spell to protect them from the culling song, the sarge says. But not to worry, he says. I have a badge and a gun and a penis. To find Mona an oyster, you only have to look for the fantastic for miracles. The amazing tabloid headlines, the young couple seen crossing Lake Michigan on foot in July, the girl who made grass grow up green and tall through the snow for buffalo starving Canada, who taught the law dogs at the animal shelter and helps them get home. Look for the magic. Look for saints. Flying Madonna, the roadkill Jesus Christ, the ivy inferno, the talking Judas cow. Keep going after the facts. Witch hunting. This isn't what a therapist will tell you to do, but it works. Mona and Oyster, this will be their world soon enough. The power has shifted. Helen and I will be forever playing catch up. Imagine if Jesus chased you around trying to catch you, save your soul. Not just a patient, passive God, but a hardworking, aggressive bloodhound. The Sarge snaps open his holster the way Helen used to snap open her little purse and he takes out a pistol. He says, Helen says, whoever says, how about we just kill him the old fashioned way? Now, this is my life. That's it, guys. Thank you guys so much for being here and listening. Oh my gosh, look, it's 2.16. It's almost a, two hours and six minutes exactly what i thought it would be um we had some problems in the beginning is zav girl still here okay so whether or not zav girl is here i'm gonna let you guys in on a secret so there's only a few of us right now here um so tomorrow Zav's birthday. you know how like we on her channel um, we sing happy birthday to people's birthdays it is. So tomorrow we, if she does a live, I don't know whether she will or not because it's her birthday. She deserves a day off, but she might. And if she does a live, we need to sing in the, um, in the chat for her. Thank you guys so much. Um, doing other books. And this will be in the playlist. So if you miss some of it, you can just go ahead and play the playlist and it'll play all four parts. And that way, you know, and since I'm not monetized, you might not get a commercial. They'll probably still like give you a commercial because YouTube likes to do that. But that might be cool because you can kind of sleep through the night because it'll be eight hours. And everybody, yeah, tomorrow... TN. Tomorrow is Zav's birthday and we need to sing to her and tell her. So thank you guys so much for coming. Hi Amanda Locklear. Hi Mama Libra Scales. Thank you guys. Thank you Karen Mueller. Thank you everybody for coming. If I didn't see your name I'm sorry. If you stopped I'm sorry I didn't say your name. Thank you guys so much. Enjoy the rest of the evening and um we'll chat soon um i'm thinking i don't know if i should do if you guys want to leave a comment on if you want me to do another chuck palnick if you want me to do fight club next i could do fight club next uh but excited thank you guys so much have a really 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 great night thank you sisters for stopping by good night everybody Dark sea, love you. Good night.